Well, we are on Exodus chapter 26 today, and I am thankful that you're here. I wish you were sitting right here at my table that we could talk about what we're learning as we study the tabernacle and hear God's instructions to Moses. That's the context, right? That's the who. God is speaking to Moses. He's giving him instructions as we have seen on how to build the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, we've talked about this, is uh, like if we looked at the original Hebrew, it would mean living place or dwelling place. Here is the place that God will dwell with his people, which is pretty spectacular to think about. Here's the God who spoke the heavens and the earth into creation and his throne, his kingdom is in the heavens, but he is going to come down and settle and live in the midst of his people. This is his heart. That's what we're learning about God, that he desires to dwell with his people. We see his desire for relationship, for fellowship, for uh family, if you will. And we also very much see that God is present. He wants to be present with his people. So we've already talked about it this week. This tabernacle, which is to be God's dwelling place, is going to be smack in the center of the Israelite camp. It will be in the center and all the peoples will encamp around God's dwelling place and ever be reminded of God's presence with them. Like, how spectacular is that, truly? Okay, so this, it, this will be God's assurance of his presence. And there's something beautiful that we learn about God's heart from that as well. He is compassionate to his people. Now, God is giving, as we have seen, he's giving very clear instructions to Moses on how to make this tabernacle and its furnishings. He doesn't leave them just stumbling around in the dark. Don't you love that? <laughs> I do. Uh, God gives us his word on what we should do. So what have we seen so far? Well, so far, God has provided instructions for the contribution uh, to gather all the things that will be needed to create this tabernacle. He's given instructions for the ark, how to make the ark, how to make the mercy seat, that atonement cover that symbolizes uh, here's the place where their sins are forgiven. Uh, he Yesterday, we saw that he gave instructions for making the table and the lampstand. And what do we have today? Well, we have curtains, lots of curtains. I meant to, I highlighted curtains here and I meant to count them all up. I'm not going to count these while I'm uh, on video right now. But curtain is mentioned a lot. Curtain is a big deal today. Curtain is mentioned quite a few times and you shall make, this verb is mentioned a whole lot of times as well, all for the purpose of making this tabernacle and tent, which is also mentioned a few times as well. So um, that's, that's the point of today's passage. So let's take a look. This first paragraph talks about the making of the curtains. And God gives very clear instructions on this. So this is the curtains of the tabernacle. And when I think of curtains, I think of something that cover my windows. In essence, these curtains... Um, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Maybe I wrote it down. These curtains, yes, these curtains function as walls for the tent, right? They function as walls for the tent. And in this first paragraph, these curtains function as walls for the tabernacle itself. These are the inner walls. And some things that I noticed about the, these curtains is that they're to be made out of colorful, fine twined linen with cherubim skillfully worked into them. 
all right? Meaning, AKA that these will be done by craftspeople. These will be created by craftspeople that are skilled in making fine twined linen with cherubim um, woven into them. Like that is not a job you could just give anyone. Uh, these are to be beautiful. Now, I, I, maybe you, like me, asked, okay, why cherubim? Friends, we saw this earlier in the week when we looked at the instructions for the building of that mercy seat. Uh, the atonement cover has the two cherubim with their wings kind of guarding that ark. And what will be inside of the ark? The word of God, uh, that tablet, the words that that God will provide Moses, that covenant agreement that they have made with one another, the people and God have made with one another. All right, so there we saw cherubim. And if I go back, if okay, the cross reference there was Genesis chapter three. And that is when God, you know, uh, banishes Adam and Eve from the garden and he sets a cherubim there. At the, at the entrance to the garden, um, and, and the purpose of the cherubim was to guard with a flaming sword the tree of life. So I, I don't know about you, but when I picture cherubim, I kind of picture like these adorable little angel babies. That's, I, I don't get that impression from Genesis chapter three to you, <laughs> not at all. This is something mighty. This is something powerful to guard something that is very important to God. And so once again, today we see that cherubim are to be uh, skillfully worked into these curtains, into the walls. And in essence, isn't there this picture that they are guarding the tabernacle. They are guarding the dwelling place of the Lord. Uh, that's that's kind of where I went with that. And this is all about, that first paragraph is all about the inner tabernacle. Now, the next two paragraphs are about curtains for a tent. Look at verse seven. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. So I don't know if I've ever really noticed this before, but we have the tabernacle, this inner tabernacle, and then we have an outer, uh, an outer tent. Why? Well, this is obviously, um, this is obviously protective, right? It is to protect the tabernacle. We can kind of look at the difference in, in, in the, um, Wow, I'm stumbling over my words in the items used to make the tent versus the items used used to used to make the tabernacle. Like for the tabernacle, uh, this is that fine twine, skillfully woven uh, linen used for the curtains and clasps of gold. Here, this is made for the tent. Uh, this is made from goat's hair and the clasps are made of bronze. So here's something hefty, heavy duty to protect the tabernacle from the elements. And on top of this uh, goat hair tent will be some coverings. We see this in verse 14. And you shall make for, a, for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins and a covering of goat skins on top. So there's going to be something really heavy duty. This is just heavy duty, right? This is heavy duty indeed to protect the tabernacle from the elements. Friends, I, I think it's important for us to remember as we talked about yesterday that all of this, these pieces of the tabernacle, uh, point to a copy, point to a shadow of heavenly things. We saw that in our cross-reference of Hebrews 8.5 yesterday. These are a shadow of heavenly things. Here's a picture in some way. This is symbolic of heaven. This is symbolic of things yet to come. All right, and because of that, I think this is very, very important for us to study and to learn about. 
Now, friends, how do we apply this? I fully admit this maybe is not the easiest lesson to apply. I think always we can praise God for what we learn about who he is. And what we've learned, what we're continuing to learn is, wow, God wants to dwell with his people. God wants to be friends with his people. Uh, God wants to be present with his people. And God provides clear instructions. Like we can, we can, we can just tuck those things in the pocket of our, of our heart and be filled up, be satisfied for the day, pondering God, who he is, praising him for who he is. Uh, I took this a step further today. And I noticed, I think what maybe kind of surprised me today is that the inner tabernacle is covered. It is protected by this outer tent, that tent serving to protect. Um, it, it's the inner tabernacle where God is to dwell. And that place is protected by this outer tent. Friends, today, uh, we've said it several times now, we have the blessing of living on this side of the cross and this understanding. Now, where does, where does God dwell? Where is God present with us? He is present in our hearts. And this is that inner, this in a sense represents that inner tabernacle. And I was thinking about how that is protected by a tent and wondered, wow, how am I protecting my heart? How am I protecting my heart? My mind just went to Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything we do flows from our heart which ought to be fully God's dwelling place. Um, so I, I was just asking God, what, what cherubim am I setting up? What cherubim do I need to set in place to guard the heart? Uh, am I storing up God's word? Is it, or is it being infiltrated by the world's word? Like, am I, am I rooted and grounded in my heart on who God says I am? Or is that being infiltrated by who the world says I am or what the world says I ought to be? Um, I hope that makes sense. That's where I went with it today. I hope that's not extrapolating God's word too far out there. Uh, I fully, I fully profess that I have something on my mind this morning. I just have on my mind this idea of beauty and how we women are so caught up in outward beauty and the extreme measures we are taking to be beautiful in the, on the outside versus what counts is this inner beauty that first Peter talks about in chapter three. Um, what are we doing to cultivate this inner beauty, that gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious to God. It's precious to God because this is where he dwells. What are we doing to guard and protect this, our hearts? Ah, a little bit to ponder for today. I'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Mm -hmm.